We're on Exodus 19, and Exodus 19 is a doozy. This is the covenant. <clears throat> in verse 1 of Exodus 19, in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now, the, the events in this chapter describe the making of what we call, we've termed the Mosaic Covenant. Um, the term Mosaic Covenant is not in Scripture because Moses didn't make it up. It's not his covenant. Uh, it's also referred to as the Old Covenant. Now, <clears throat> this term is used in Hebrews, but only in reference to a contrast between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. That's in Hebrews 8, verse 13. And when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Um, the important issue to remember here is not the term that's used. The important thing to remember is that this is a covenant. Now, a covenant is a binding agreement between two parties. That's what it is. That's what we have in this chapter. Israel's going to make a covenant with Elohim, and Elohim is going to make a covenant with Israel. Verse, 19, or verse 2 of chapter 19. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to Elohim, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, Elohim is pointing out that Israel's been a recipient of the grace or favor of the Father through nothing that they've done themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yes, he, he's saying to Moses, you, uh, you tell the Egyptian, excuse me, you tell the Israelites this. Right, Moses didn't do it, right. Right, and this is what he wants, uh, he wants Moses to convey to the, to the people. Right. Verse 5, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. <clears throat> now, Elohim chose Israel. In Psalm 135, verse 4, we read, For Yahweh has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. See, that's the people that Elohim chose from his own possession, is Israel. There's no place in Scripture that says he chose anybody else. Okay? It's only Israel. Now, this is what Elohim is proposing to the people. If they obey his voice, then Israel will be his own possession. We're told the same thing as, as believers in Yeshua, which means that those who are followers of Messiah and his ways are a part of Israel. In uh, Titus 2, starting at verse 11, <coughs> we read, For the grace of Elohim has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Now, that verse 12 there, do you see? He, he states in one, two, three, four, five different ways that we are be, uh, to be obedient to the Torah. I'm just so happy that Windows wants to update me. Thank you. <clears throat> In verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great Elohim and, and Messiah, uh, excuse me, Savior, Messiah Yeshua, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Let these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Well, how many times in that passage is, is he re, re, uh, referencing following the Torah? Just in verse 12, instructing us, deny ungodliness, that's one. Deny worldly desires, that's two. 
lifts us sensibly, that's three, uh, righteously, that's four, and godly. Five times, he says in that verse, be obedient to the Torah in different ways. <clears throat> and then he talks about the new covenant, verse 14, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Also, Ephesians 4, starting at verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of Elohim has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not let, uh, give the devil an opportunity let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he might have something to share with him who has need. So, uh, if we are, are obedient to the Father, if we're obedient to his ways, if we're followers of Messiah, which is, means we act like him, then we're his people, we're a part of Israel. Verse 6, and he says, uh, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. If, uh, if you trust in Yeshua as Messiah, we become a part of Israel. Elohim says that Israel is to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A holy nation meaning set apart. Okay. Now Peter quotes this passage in reference to all believers in Messiah and followers of his ways. In 1 Peter 2, verses 5 and 9, we read, You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua and Messiah. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for Elohim's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Well, Peter's telling his audience, you're, you're Israel, okay? You are Israel. Because he's quoting uh, Exodus 19, verse 6. That same reference is used by John for all believers when he wrote the Revelation. Revelation 1, verse 6. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his Elohim and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's past tense. He has made us, okay, to be a kingdom. What's the kingdom? Israel. Okay? And Israel's supposed to be a nation of priests. Priests. If you read Revelation 5, verse 10, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our Elohim, and they'll reign upon the earth. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Okay, this is very difficult for a lot of people to understand. It's not difficult at all. It's very simple. Um, at one time, we were dead in our transgressions and sins, we were told. That's what Paul wrote, right? Then came the breath of the Father, and it made us alive again. That's the first resurrection. Okay? Over these who are a part of that first resurrection, over these the second death has no power. But they'll be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay? The thousand years, once again, Revelation symbolic, the, the thousand years is what's taking place right now. Because we've been made alive again through the Spirit of the Father. And we're reigning on earth with him. <clears throat> Verse 7 of Exodus 19. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words which Yahweh had commanded him. So Moses is going to present this covenant, okay, to all the elders of the people. They have the opportunity now to say, do we want to be a part of this agreement or not? Verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. So the elders of the people agreed. They're going to abide by all that Elohim has spoken. 
That's the covenant, okay? That's the covenant. It's the agreement by the people to do all the instructions of Elohim. That's the covenant. That's the agreement. That's not the Torah. The Torah are the terms of the agreement. All right? Uh, if you sign with the bank to purchase a house, and you're going to make payments to the bank, and you don't make your payments, does that mean the house is destroyed? No, the house is still there. But what's broken? The agreement with the bank. Okay? It's the covenant that's broken. That doesn't destroy the house. That does not destroy the Torah if they break this covenant. It breaks the covenant with the people. It breaks the agreement. Now, the people did the right thing here to agree to the covenant. This fact is demonstrated when Elohim commends their response. This is in Deuteronomy 5. Starting at verse 27, we read, Go near and hear all that Yahweh our Elohim says, then speak to us all that Yahweh our Elohim will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. And Yahweh heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and Yahweh said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They've done well in all that they've spoken. Okay, so they did the right thing here. The next verse, though, tells us what the problem is. This is very important, okay? They did the right thing by agreeing to the covenant, but there's a problem. And this next verse here in Deuteronomy tells us exactly what, exactly what the problem is. He says, the problem is, in their hearts, they don't fear Elohim. Verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me, and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. So you see, there was nothing wrong with this covenant. There was nothing at all wrong for that covenant, with that covenant. What was wrong? The hearts of the people. That's what's wrong. Okay? They don't have a heart to fear him and keep his ways. All right? So what's needed to make this work? What is needed to make this work? Do we need to change the covenant? No. No. Covenant's good. Oh, got to change the hearts of the people. If only there was a way for Elohim to change our hearts. Give us a heart that would fear him so that we can be obedient to his ways. If that were to happen, this would work. Well, let's, let's look at that new covenant and see what it's providing and what it does different. It's in Jeremiah 31, starting at verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now look at who's it with again. Who's it with? You see, um, this is why I don't call myself a Christian because I'm not a part of that, that contemporary group, all right? I'm not a part of any denomination. I, I don't agree with pretty much anything they, they believe in. I'm a part of Israel, okay? And that's who the covenant's with. He says, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, and the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. In verse 33 of Jeremiah 31, But this is the covenant which I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I'll put my Torah within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I'll be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh, for I'll forgive their iniquity, and their sin I'll remember no more. You see, he's saying here, I'm going to put my Torah on their hearts and on their minds. I'm going to write it there. And then we're going to have our covenant. I'll be their Elohim, they'll be my people. Which is what that covenant was. The original covenant was. If you obey my Torah, then I'll be your Elohim, you'll be my people. Well, he says, that's what, that's what I'm going to do here. 
And they won't have to teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, uh, hey, do you know Yahweh? Well, yeah, he wrote it on my heart, his ways. That's how I know him. Well, all of his people that he chooses are going to know him. Yeah. Is that, is that actually what happened in Pentecost? That's, what, that's where it started. Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. It started at that Pentecost. <clears throat> I used to say the first Pentecost back when I was ignorant. <laughs> Pentecost been going on for a long time before that. Thousands of years. <clears throat> uh, you know, it involves only Israel and Judah. And notice that he says, here, but this covenant which I'll make with the house of Israel. Okay, He knows when he makes a covenant, there's not going to be two houses. He knows when he makes that covenant, there's just going to be one house, just Israel. Okay, <clears throat> And both times, with both covenants, it involved a mixed multitude. There were people from all, a lot of nations involved. It never was just a bloodline, never was a bloodline. The only difference between the alleged Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that Elohim will write his Torah on our hearts and minds. Once again, it's something he's going to do. It's not something we're going to do. Well, I'll make a New Covenant with these people if they're better people this time. Okay? If they will straighten up. If they will get off their high horse and learn to do what I say. It doesn't say that, does it? You know, our, uh, our self-help stuff doesn't really do that much or for very long. <clears throat> he fixes our problem we had with the original covenant by giving us a new heart. Look how it's termed in Ezekiel. Chapter 36, starting at verse 24. For I'll take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Notice how that's been happening for over 100 years now. Then I'll sprinkle clean water on you. What does running water represent in Scripture symbolically? Spirit of the Father. And you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. Put a new breath. That's a Hebrew word, ruach. Don't think about ghosts, okay? A new breath of the Father within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone, that stubborn heart, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my breath within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You'll be careful to observe my ordinances. And you'll live in the land that I gave your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I'll be your Elohim. And that's what's happening today. Okay, this is what's happening. It's been happening for 2,000 years, but it's happening again today. <clears throat> While this new covenant won't be fully consummated until the return of Messiah, we see the shadow of this fulfillment when we are redeemed through the blood of Yeshua. Paul tells us this in Romans 10. And Romans 10, starting at verse 4, Paul writes, For Messiah is the end of the Torah for righteousness to everyone who believes. And that is such a badly translated verse. Such a badly, poorly translated verse. <coughs> the word for end is the Greek word teleos. It means goal. It's the goal. This is the only place in Scripture where it is translated to mean that something is finished. The only place in Scripture that translated this way. <coughs> but it means the goal to reach. Messiah is the goal to reach of the Torah for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the Torah, shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on, the, on faithfulness speaks, uh, speaks thus. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Messiah down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Messiah up 
from the dead. Now, in this passage, Paul is quoting, see, this is capitalized here. Uh, that's, he's quoting Moses is what he's doing. He's quoting Moses as telling the people that Torah is right there in front of them. Okay, it's right there in their hearts and in their, in their, uh, on their lips. Look at what he's quoting here in Deuteronomy 30, starting at verse 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it, uh, get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. See, Paul writes the same thing, only instead he, he places Messiah in place of the Torah. Why would he do that? Why does he say Messiah there instead of the Torah? Because he's the Torah made flesh. He's the Torah that walked, in, that walked among them. <clears throat> and he cont Paul continues in Romans 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faithfulness which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Yeshua as master and believe in your heart that Elohim raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've had that quoted to me. Saying, see, all you got to do is ask Jesus in your heart. You got to read the next verse. For with the heart man believes or trusts in the Father, resulting in righteousness. What is righteousness again? Following the Torah. It results in following the Torah. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Okay, if, if the believing which results in following the Torah isn't there, what do you have? Nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> Any questions on that before we move on? That's the Old Covenant and New Covenant. Okay, that's the difference. The one thing is lacking. There's one thing they lacked. It was a heart that feared Elohim to cause them to be obedient. That's what they lacked. Verse 9 of Exodus 19. And Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud, in order that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to Yahweh. Elohim is uh, going to come to Moses in a thick cloud. Now all the people will, will hear the words of Elohim so they will know that this covenant is with Elohim and they will believe the words of Moses forever. Okay, that's the purpose. This isn't the only time Elohim is clothed in a cloud, too. When Messiah returns, he's going to be clothed in a cloud to reclaim all of creation, especially his land and his people. In Revelation 10, starting at verse 1, and I saw another strong angel come down out of heaven. This is Messiah, clothed with a cloud. Angel just means messenger. And John is just writing what he sees and what he, uh, the way he perceives it. And the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. And he placed, in his, right, uh, he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Now, when we get into Revelation, we'll uh, get back into this. This is symbolic. What John is seeing is symbolic. In his hand is a little book. What do you think that little book is? The uh, book of life. Why is it a little book? There's not much in it. There's not much in it. That's right. There's not near as much in it as one might think. People would think that there's going to be just billions of names in there, but that's not the case. Okay? That's not the case. <clears throat> Verses 10 and 11 of Exodus 19. Yahweh also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day Yahweh will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. <clears throat> now, what does Elohim mean when he says the people are to be consecrated today and tomorrow? What does consecrate mean again? To be set apart, okay? To be set apart from the rest of the world. It means to be made holy. Uh, to be sanctified means the same thing, okay? To be made holy. 
to be made set apart. <clears throat> and if we combine it with the command to wash their garments, it means they're to be, they're, them and their garments are to be washed and clean, set apart also. This is probably a foreshadowing of baptism. Baptism is a cleansing to prepare people to face Elohim or be a part of his covenant. Okay? And once again, it's a symbolic act, but it's a, it's a setting apart of that person to be a part of the covenant with Elohim. What are the people doing here? They're preparing themselves to be set apart to be a part of that covenant. All right? And also, when someone is brought into the priesthood, they're washed. Okay? Israel is to be a nation of what? Priests. That's why we baptize. Okay? That's why we do that. <clears throat> Verses 12 and 13. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. If any person or beast touches the mountain, they're going to be killed. No one is to even touch the offending one who touches the mountain. If they do, they're to be stoned or shot through with an arrow. Verses 14 and 15. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. So the people were to wash for ten days and, uh, and wash their clothes. And they were not to engage in uh, sexual contact for the next two days. That's all part of being consecrated. Okay? Being set apart for, for this particular thing. And it's also, uh, you know, for, it could be for other things too, but it, it's part of that being consecrated. <clears throat> Verse 16, so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. So Elohim appeared, appeared to them on the third day. You know what this is a shadow of? What else happened on the third day? The Messiah resurrected, that's right. And when he appeared, what happened to the earth? There was a fierce earthquake. Well, these coincidences are crazy, aren't they? The earth quaked on the third day from that rock-hewn grave on the mountain. That's in Matthew 28, starting at verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the master descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his garment was as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Yeshua who has been crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you into Galilee. There you'll see him, and behold, I've told you. They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Yeshua met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Yeshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take my word to my brethren, or take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they shall see me. Now, while, while they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. Let's go back to Exodus, verses 17 and 18, chapter, of chapter 19. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. Okay, the people witnessed the lightning flashes, the thick cloud, the loud trumpet sound, and they trembled. Now this type of appearance to the people, it frightened them greatly. They did not wish to face Elohim again in this manner. And Elohim told them, okay, you don't want to face me like this again. I'd say that's pretty smart on your part. Okay? 
That's pretty smart on your part. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this differently. All right? What I'm going to do, instead of me speaking to you and possibility of everyone just getting wiped out and dying, maybe the earth opening up and swallowing you and then closing back up again, uh, instead of that, I'm going to send a prophet like Moses with my words. Okay? I'm going to send a prophet just like Moses. And he's going to have my words. And you better listen to him. That's in Deuteronomy 18, starting at verse 15. Yahweh your Elohim will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of Yahweh your Elohim in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my, my Elohim. Let me not see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And Yahweh said to me, They have spoken well. Well, that's pretty smart. I'll raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. And I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whom, whoever does not listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Now, this, I, I put a picture up here. This is Jacob L. Laws in, in Saudi Arabia, which is most likely the, the, uh, the location of Mount Sinai. Here, do you see this uh, on top of the mountain here on the, on the peak? You see that shadow here? That's not a shadow. Okay, the top of the mountain is granite, and it's burnt granite. All of that is burnt granite up there. Okay? Uh, and there, there are uh, dozens of reasons why this is probably Mount Sinai, uh, and that's no coincidence. Um, granite doesn't burn easy. And look how much of it burnt. Quite a bit of it. This is what frightened the people so much. Exodus 19, verses 19 and 20. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and Elohim answered him with thunder. And Yahweh came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So Moses goes up to the top of the mountain. He's going to meet with Elohim. Verse 21, then Yahweh spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people, lest they... Break through to Yahweh to gaze, and many of them perish. The people are not to gaze upon the cloud and try to see Elohim. Okay? Don't do that. Now, the high priest, on the one day he's supposed to go in the Holy of Holies, which has the presence of Elohim in it, what's he supposed to have? What's he supposed to take with him? He has blood with him, but what else? What? <laughs> uh... He has a censer. He burns incense, and he gets this smoky in there, real smoky in there. Okay? Why? So he can't see Elohim. So can't see Elohim. Yep. Yep. Well, same type thing here. Don't let the people try and look, okay, through the cloud. Yeah, that's, just, that's what we have to do. I know, that was, that's the legend. They say they tie a rope around his ankle. Because if you hear a thump, like a, a sack of potatoes hitting the ground, like maybe he looked, then they drag him out because no one's going to go in there to try and get him. <laughs> so, but there's no, there's no record of that rope actually existing. So, but it makes sense. <clears throat> Verses 22 and 23, and also the, uh, let the priests who come near to Yahweh consecrate themselves, lest Yahweh break out against them. And Moses said to Yahweh, the people could not come up to Mount Sinai, for you did warn us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. <clears throat> um, what we have here in Mount Sinai is really a picture of the tabernacle before the tabernacle was designed. The top of the mountain where Elohim was physically present is a picture of the Holy of Holies. Okay? And only one man could go up there. This is Moses. He's the only one that can go up there. The sides of the mountain are a picture of the holy place. Now, this is a place that only the other priests could go. Okay? And <clears throat> the area surrounding the mountain where the altar was built, that's a picture of the outer court where all the people are. All right, so what we have here with Mount Sinai is a, is a picture of what the tabernacle will, will do and what it will be. 
Verses 24 and 25, Then Yahweh said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So Moses went back down the mountain to bring Aaron and uh, to bring Aaron and the and the priests will 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 go up to the. uh, No, he said the people do not let the priests and the people break through to come up. So just bring Aaron. Any questions on Exodus nineteen? One of my favorite chapters. Yeah, I know. That's uh, a pretty good trip, isn't it? Yeah, uh-huh. Yep. You see, and, um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, just real quick, it's the... The area around the mountain where the people were, they had an altar down there too where they were doing offerings. So, that representing that courtyard. That almost looks like, I mean, almost a diagram from how to walk. The whole process is that the presence. Yeah. Yep. And the, the laver, what was that for? That's for cleaning, yeah. Yeah, Christianity thinks uh, baptism is their invention. No, uh uh-uh. No, no. Yeah. Right? Every time they would go in and serve, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And when they were ordained... More, more than one meaning, it does. It does. It has more than one meaning. Uh, in the in the Brit Hadashah, the Greek word is baptizo, and if you have a good Greek lexicon, it'll have, I believe, twenty-two different meanings for the word. So it could mean to, to be associated with. You know, we are baptized into Messiah. You've heard that. That means we're associated with Him. 